And we have Britt on camera. Hey, Britt, nice to see you. Good to see you, David. <laughs> that beautiful background. Yeah, sunny day in Portland. <laughs> Wonderful. So happy that we can host this. This is our first quote unquote live stream, and we'll be posting this out to our Facebook groups. Uh, we also have a few wonderful people in the audience who are kind enough to take time late in the day on a Monday to join us for the conversation. Thank you, everyone. And I'm sure a few more people will trickle in, but I think we can get started. And Great. as we do, I'll offer a brief introduction to myself for those of the audience that might be watching this and not know about my, my own background and why I co-founded and became CEO of Maya. And then Britt, I would love you to give a similar introduction to yourself and the National Psychedelics Association. Great. So uh, my journey started many, many years ago with psychedelics and then became my full-time profession in uh, 2019. I was one of the leads in the Decriminalized Denver Initiative to help Denver be the first city in the US to reform psilocybin policy. And now that initiative has spawned many other similar movements around the country and even the world. I then co-founded a nonprofit called Unlimited Sciences to fund psilocybin research with Johns Hopkins University. And then in 2019, 2020, I founded Maya as a software company building technologies to help practitioners and researchers of psychedelic medicine, as well as those individuals who are choosing psychedelics to be able to capture more specific data, more specific understanding around these journeys because they are so complex and involve so many nuances and characteristics. And I believe that a data science approach is going to be the most expedient way for us all to learn how we can engage with these compounds more safely, more effectively, and hopefully in a way that brings about new paradigms and models for everyone who chooses to be able to afford and access psychedelic treatments. And Today we'll be speaking about all of those topics as well as uh, summarizing the experience that Britt and I had as well as some of you in the audience who were at Horizons Pacific Northwest, which happened just recently. And there was a lot to learn from that weekend in Portland. And I'll hand it over to you, Britt, to give a similar introduction. Yeah, thank you, David. And um, I always forget about your work in, in Denver. So thank you for that. That kind of set off uh, a lot of the work that we'll be talking about today on the you know kind of state models. Um, what brought me into this space specifically as an individual um, and, you know, to be the CEO of MPA is um, my background is in pharmaceutical marketing and advertising and spent about 20 years doing that specifically in the psychotropic space, working with uh, atypical antipsychotics, uh, antidepressants, things the like. Personally, though, uh, during that time, I was also using a lot of these same medications as prescribed by my own psychiatrist <clears throat> after battling uh, anxiety and depression for most, if not all, of my adult life and, and a good part of, of my uh, adolescence growing up, it was one of those pieces where I, I knew that the medicines weren't working for me, yet I was out there and helping push them in the same manner, uh, knowing they wouldn't work for everybody. Luckily, I got the chance to have underground therapy, and that's really what changed my life and put me on the path to be here today, uh, having this conversation and, and really what led me to uh, found the National Psychedelics Association with my co-founder, Chris Olson. Um, we are really looking to, um, there we go. Um, we are really looking to make sure that these are accessible medications and having the privilege to have uh, been in San Francisco, had access to a therapist who uh, suggested something like this, and then to have access to somebody who could provide these therapies uh, is something that we're focused on. So at the MPA, we want to make sure that these are accessible to all Americans and they have all Americans have the support they need accessing these therapies. And so we'll be looking to focus on state modeled um, programs like here in Oregon with Measure 109 and what you have coming up in Colorado uh, that's on the ballot this November and really to provide the business infrastructure to help ensure that these state models uh, are accessible, that they are there to provide for all those who won't be able to access these medicines through the current medical model as it stands. So um, yeah, my background is really uh, somebody who's been uh, with medicine, in the medicine, and now um, helping to extol the virtues of, of this medicine and, and how it can help others and making sure it's accessible. 
Thank you so much. And thank you for the work you do with your team. So there's yeah. much more that we can share and unpack from, from that journey you're on. But I think we want to start with the um, recap on our experience at Horizons. And for yeah. those watching who don't know, Horizons is one of the longest standing conferences in the psychedelic space and has been a mainstay in New York where the event happens annually. And that will be happening again later this year. But this was the first year, the inaugur inaugural year for Horizons to create a, a satellite, which was in Portland in honor of the changing legislation in Oregon. And it was quite the hub. It was quite the epicenter for anyone interested in statewide models, state initiatives, as well as, of course, the Oregon community who gathered in force to discuss many of the most pertinent issues um, as part of unrolling psilocybin services and love to hand it over to you since you are now a Portland local and uh, very much surrounded by the community there. Why don't you kick us off with some of the key observations you made from being at the event? Yeah, no, thank you. And yeah, Horizons was uh, an amazing uh, gathering of community and, and people coming together. And a lot of the topics that were discussed on stage are pertinent to um, both what our organizations are looking to achieve in the world, right? Making sure that, that we understand how these uh, medicus, medicines can be used for, um, you know, to improve the, the lives of individuals everywhere, right? And make sure that we can help advance that. Some of the big topics that really stood out were uh, the need to focus on and to provide for marginalized communities and diversity and representation, I think. You know, that really sits home with me when I think about Sunday, the, the final day of the event and a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the information and content that was there was really about starting off the day with indigenous reciprocity and making sure that we understand, you know, where, where this is headed. And then throughout the day, the continued conversations around the need to ensure diverse voices have a platform in this newly budding ecosystem and that um, really I think that was a nice way to end the event right was to remind ourselves that we need to look out for everyone as we pull these things forward. Absolutely. I would agree that uh, diversity, equity and inclusion were sort of just some name, some words to encapsulate a much broader, much more nuanced topic or set of topics yeah. which, uh, which involves so many questions and what I what I noticed was more questions than answers and certainly a lot of discussion, a lot of heartfelt agreement about the importance of these things and yet um, still a lot of wonder and uh, curiosity about how that will convert into tangible actions for Oregon and that will then of course create models that might inspire other states and I'm curious whether you found that there were any either conversations or talks you had uh, talks you had listened to on stage that gave you a sense that uh, one particular model or one initiative or even a part of that is likely to, to to take place in Oregon that you think will be effective in some way. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there are a lot of people who have this as part of their remit. I think everyone should have this as part of their remit, right? As they're entering the space to have a focus. And things like diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, all these very um, important words that are very complex and have, you know, very nuanced meanings to them. But at the end of the day, I think that when we, I, I won't point to any one certain conversation. I don't think there's one solution that we're looking for here. What I did see was a need to recognize that we don't have the answers, that this is the first time that a nation, a Western country, such as the United States, has tried anything like this uh, at this scale, or uh, even a state in a country like this. And so I think that the, the recognition was that we have the opportunity to do this better. I don't think that anybody knows the right necessary way to get that done. I think that the, what we heard on stage and throughout the week uh, of Horizons was that there are a lot of really heart-centric people who want to ensure that that is a part of these conversations. And even though the solutions may not be there right now um, and, and that they're still being developed, I think that there is uh, this at least focus and continued uh, conversation around it, which is important to keep it top of mind as we're looking for solutions. And 
Again, a lot of this will come down to rules, I think, at the end of the day, as the rules are finalized and written, we'll understand then where do players in this space need to step up to ensure things are more equitable, more inclusive, right? And providers are more diverse. Yeah, I think that's well said and and serves as a bit of a segue onto one of the other the meta topics that was discussed commonly throughout the event, and that's how are we going to actually know whether this initiative been, has been successful on a, a wide range of metrics and scales. Um, and that ranges from medical outcomes. <laughs> we have a, a new team member on the, on the line. Oh yeah, one second, sorry. <laughs> yeah. We have, um, of course, the, the validated measures of wellness, well-being, health, uh, and these sort of aspects of, of holistic well, wellness, and then there's also the uh, societal and um, the, the the infrastructure that is going to be in place, and the results that that will have on various communities throughout the state. And then, of course, there's the financial models that have to make sense for all the players and stakeholders involved. Um, and so, so many things need to be measured. And I think one of the Maybe after equity and inclusion, the next highest uh, or mo most frequent conversation I heard was being had around the topic of data and data capture. There were a lot of calls for invitations to practitioners as well as researchers, as well as the individual populace to then uh, take part in capturing data that can maybe inform the, the various stakeholders one year, two years down the line, as well as informing other states about what had worked and what hadn't. And I know there are a few um, creators of different systems. Maya is one of them that we, we hope will play a major role in enabling the community to capture validated and, and well-structured data. Uh, without talking necessarily about any one company, curious if you noticed um, specific ways that data could be captured in the early days. No, no end to how much data and the complexity of data that could be captured in the future, but where do you think the starting point is going to be for that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And data, I think, was the underpinning of a lot of the conversations, even if it wasn't the uh, expressed subject matter of a conversation, right? If we look back to like Thursday and a lot of the business issues that are associated with this, all this goes back to information and making informed decisions, which in business, a lot of times that's the way it's need to be run. And so um, data was really was top of mind for a lot of folks who were there. And I think it's important that we step, because a lot of what we heard um, on data expressly heard was, um, you know, there there is a need for us to be able to not only um, ensure this is successful, but I think we also heard that this is the first time this is being done. Again, optimizations will need to be made. We should not believe that we have nailed this right out of the gate such that way there isn't any room for growth and room for growth and growing requires learning and recognition of patterns and seeing how things are, are being played out such that way we can um, course correct if needed. And so I think what was discussed, um, you know, by a number of presenters on, on throughout the week, but also, you know, specifically on Saturday was there's going to be a need for, for data to be captured so that way we do have the learning, um, the, the messages, the, the understanding of what's occurring, such that way we can move it forward in other states, but also so we can improve it in places like Oregon, right, here in my backyard. That's it. And I think an extension on that point is something that's discussed in the psychedelic space is that we're all pushing the edge of what is acceptable, what's legal, uh, the amount of stigma around psychedelics for many decades makes this a very hard challenge. And there's also a perceived risk that if we get it wrong, and if there is uh, a set of potential adverse outcomes, meaning somebody's creating harm to themselves or to others or having a permanent psychological or medical damage from a psychedelic experience in the legal framework, for example, in Oregon, then we could really bring down the entire movement and industry and community and uh, there is a very real risk of that. Um, my hypothesis is that the only reason that's a risk is because we can't currently point to what went wrong very clearly and identify that this was actually one case of a certain circumstance, perhaps a bad actor in the 
in the skin of the, the provider, um, the facilitator, uh, or perhaps a lack of education for the re recipient, a lack of uh, integration support and, and this kind of thing. And where data comes in most handy is not to sort of inform capitalist infrastructure, it's actually to help us all be learning. Like you said, it comes down to information and that requires a great deal of trust because uh, there are many companies and uh, foundation or, or organizations out there that use data um, potentially maliciously or use data in a way that does come back to harm the individual that provided it. And if not harm them, at least be extractive to them. And we're all in the business of creating trust in this space such that the populace will feel comfortable contributing their own journeys as part of the, the cultural evolution. And that really, I think, segues nicely into the topic of privacy. And privacy was also discussed a lot in Oregon. And you know, that can be a tricky one because often privacy takes a lot of legal constructs that most of us lay people don't understand. Or, and then there's a lot of sort of technological constructs that can help ensure privacy, but most people aren't engineers and programmers that can understand that language either. Um, so curious if you have, if you want to pull on any of those threads and, and comment on what was discussed. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, right, data sovereignty and um, the ability to be informed about how your data is being used is very important. And especially when we're talking about something so important as a person seeking assistance, perhaps therapeutically with what is also known as a schedule one substance or an illegal drug, right? Um, it's really important that we recognize that this isn't just your, you know, your uh, MP3 list or, or what have you, or, you know, what, you know, your latest call log. This is truly uh, a ther this can be a therapeutic invention in some areas, especially at the state side. And, and as such, there's even more sensitive information, right, that could be released that people would be, want to make sure is not. And so I think people need to understand. And I think that the, the real conversations that we were having both seeing on stage and, and, you know, in the halls outside of the conference was that, you know, data is both important and perilous in the same way that it could be both something that proves this out and helps us get forward if we can get there. But at the same time, it runs the risk of, of putting a lot of people either in danger or, or at the perceived risk of danger by having their data collected on something like this. So I, again, I think it's, it's too early to tell. I think that um, the conversations that I had though and, and, the, and the folks that were on stage did all recognize the importance of being able to both improve upon the Oregon model here in Oregon itself, but as well as as it's kind of adopted in some format in, in other states and as it's applied and, and moved into other states who are seeking the same type of uh, services program. So there's this recognition that the data will be important, but also this recognition that might be hard to capture. And I think that that's where we really need to be able to go to the, the public and let them know why it's important to help them understand what it's going to be used for and have them buy in to it, right? Have them have the option of providing that data. And um, it's, you know, I think with all the noise around Facebook and the social media and everything else in the world these days, I think people are very wary of what folks can do with data and what that means. So I think there needs to be like psychedelics, a bit of re-education uh, on, on data and data capture, right? Like it, it, it is something to be, um, to respect and, and to understand how it can be used for important things, but also how it can be harmful. Mm -hmm. And well said. I think the last uh, meta topic that I would like to, us to touch on before we go on to discuss what you're seeing unfold in Oregon, and I really want to actually let this be a, a channel for you to share some of the sort of inner learnings that you've had from so many countless conversations in Oregon with the various groups and stakeholders. I really want to make sure we have time on this live stream to share this with the audience and, and give a little deeper insight into what's actually happening there. Uh, what have been the biggest challenges and what is going to happen over the next say three to six months? Um, ideally the, the kind of information that can't be read easily in the news or online. So let's yeah. get to that. I think as a bridge to that, I'd love you to speak to the 
educational piece for facilitators to become licensed and for anyone who's going to be watching this that isn't aware there's the uh, model of facilitators who will be licensed to actually deliver and hold space for somebody going through a psilocybin journey and then uh, service centers which is the official name being given to the physical locations where facilitators can work and these are important words and um, it's it's been very clear as part of the unfolding of measure 109 that therapists and clinics and these types of words that we might be used to from the medical or therapeutic paradigm are not being used there so uh, let's speak to that a little bit and then maybe you can talk to the uh, training groups that are being established some of the challenges they've had i know with the insurance piece would love to hear about that yeah no that's great um yeah, I think one of the things, uh, you know, looking at horizons and then kind of moving forward with the meta topics uh, around facilitator training, um, for those who are listening in, really in Oregon, the psilocybin services, um, you know, program will be providing it to, it's basically supervised adult use. It's not considered therapy because um, in order to make this more equitably available, this was a... Um, would say it, it was a decision that was made with uh, some some conscious thinking around it was that in order for this to be more equitably available we can't rely just on those who have the clinical titles or you know letters behind their name to be providing these therapies that a isn't representative of the populations in our communities if we look at those uh, nothing wrong with it but psychiatrists and psychologists who are currently in there um, most of them are a cisgendered uh, white heterosexual individuals. And what that accounts for is, is there's a lack of diversity there. And so when we look at the facilitator programs in Oregon, these are going to allow for those folks with GED equivalents to become licensed facilitators. And that's an important distinction from what we think of in the medical model and what will be occurring uh, with the FDA um, programs. Um, and so in that model with these new folks who are going to be new to this um, type of perhaps therapeutic intervention, what's going to be important is that they understand also the importance of data, right? And that these training programs are under, uh, helping the future facilitators who are going to be holding these spaces um, to their conversation earlier, understand you know, how data could be used, what it could be important for and, and why it should be captured. So that way this program and others can continue to uh, improve. Um, yeah, so the facilitator trainings here in Oregon, these, this licensure set um, as a group will be working as, you know, kind of um, holding space for individuals uh, who are seeking these, uh, you know, therapies who are 21 and above, um, but we call them facilitators. And then the service centers where the therapies are provided, those will be uh, establishments where you will go and they will actually dispense the psilocybin. And then you will go have your experience in one of their um, rooms or session uh, areas. And so, you know, to your question, right, what is what were the conversations there and, and how does that playing out? Um, we're really looking to collaborate with the training programs to look to, um, you know, incentivize data collection and in the appropriate, um, you know, kind of uh, ethical way, such that way, um, if by incentivizing those and our members who will be, you know, training programs and or facilitators, we want to incentivize them and provide ways of reducing either their member fees or otherwise to provide that data because it is so important. So we'll be looking for partners like yourself and other platforms and anyone who really wants to, to partake in this to find avenues to, to ensure that we're collecting uh, the data that's really going to not only prove this out as uh, an option outside of the medical system, but also helps us optimize it over time. And so I think that may answer on your facilitator question in a roundabout way. It does, and I know there's so much more to say on that topic. So what happened with the uh, with the pause in some of these facilitators or these training groups um, being able to recruit new applicants to their programs? Yeah, so, you know, this is a new thing, right? Everybody who's doing this is new and a lot of things will come up uh, along the way, right? And one of the things that came up was here in Oregon uh, is kind of the higher education um, credentialing body here in Oregon, the HECC, um, the training programs need to be approved by them. And so it's made a little bit of setback in the processes for this program taking off. Um, but it looks like all of the, all the training programs are now able to license and 
uh, moving forward, what they will be able to do is uh, starting next year, um, accepting facilitators and then hopefully by all accounts uh, start early Q2, perhaps Q1 of next year with the actual sessions beginning. Um, and that some of those timelines I were touched on uh, with Angie Albee and others in the, in the call. Um, but with that, one of the issues that surrounds these is, and it will be a problem for a lot of the state operators and this is where MPAs coming in is looking to be able to provide the type of insurance that's required to get those types of certifications, but also to be able to run a business, right? To be able to um, protect oneself from any type of, uh, you know, suits uh, that are um, unfounded or uh, unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for the audience, let's clarify the insurance is needed in order for somebody to train another facilitator or in order for a facilitator yeah. to open their business or both? Yeah, no. So the training programs are the only ones currently looking to require insurance through this um, HECC, uh, but they are looking for ways to work around that right now to ensure to make this move a little faster. But no, other programs uh, currently, as and rules are still being written, um, don't have any insurance requirements associated with them. Uh, the training programs do because they are providing an education uh, that students have to pay for. And because of that, they're there's a need that they are insured as an organization, is my understanding. Thanks so much for clarifying that. Yeah. How many training groups of various types have you come across? How many do you think there are mobilizing at the moment? Uh, you know, uh, there's quite a few. Uh, there's a number of them, you know, everything, you know, working closely uh, with a number of these organizations, everything from those who are focusing on uh, say more focused communities like BIPOC communities or LGBTQ communities, all the way to uh, groups that are focused on more clinical uh, style facilitation, uh, training uh, more of the clinician set like psychiatrists and psychologists. And so um, I don't know an exact number at this point, right? About how many there are, I'd say at least a dozen or so that I've, that I've identified that are looking to uh, or have already obtained uh, their ability to um, lead facilitator trainings. Very helpful. Yeah. Now the, uh, the topic of biotech and pharmaceuticals comes to mind yeah. and it would be really interesting to hear how the actual psilocybin compound is going to be uh, available from one of these service centers or in a facilitator's and, yeah. and and what is going to be the supply chain for that process, as well as any of the sort of restrictions or challenges that are being experienced in getting that set up? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the way the state's looking at it is to go very, um, you know, to keep that aperture, aperture of, of the focus very narrow and to really focus in on um, one strain of psychedelic mushroom, uh, as far as from a manufacturing standpoint, and really not allowing for synthetics. We're really, I think the state's really looking at this point only at um, natural or extractions uh, as far as the type of compounds. Um, and your question of like, what will that look like in, in practice, right? I mean, it could be in any number of formats. I don't, I haven't seen the latest on the rules, but I believe that there will be some product differentiation, right? Uh, in order to make it more accessible for more individuals, right? Whether that's in a tincture or some kind of drink or perhaps a chocolate. Um, would be the type of products that they'll be providing if, if that's what you're uh, asking. But um, one of, but to, yeah, sorry. And do you think these, uh, these psilocybin containing mushrooms will all be grown within state borders of Oregon? Yeah, I mean, that's a funny question. It's, there's a few things that have come up uh, on the way to this um, that I think everyone needs to keep in mind, this is very new, right? And with new things come unforeseen hazards. Um, one of the things about uh, the, the growth of these products, it won't be like cannabis. There aren't going to need to be fields and fields and fields of crop for a number of reasons. Uh, these services, people are not going to be using and consuming uh, in a regular fashion uh, on a regular basis, most likely, right? These are going to be uh, specific dates where you go into a center and you have an appointment and you, you're there for the day. These won't be things that you can do in, at your own or on, at your home. And so the amount of products coming through the system is going to be much smaller and uh, mushrooms require a lot less space. So really, 
you're not going to require a whole lot of different manufacturers in this space, uh, as, as it were. And so probably if they are able to stand it up, they would look, it'd be just a, a couple of them that were looking to, to grow in state mushrooms for the program here, uh, in Oregon. And I believe that much like cannabis, it could only be in Oregon grown product because of the federal regulations of crossing state lines with a schedule one substance. That's what I've been hearing as well. And, and it was very obvious at the Horizons conference, there was an absence in attendance amongst the biotech pharmaceutical community. Unless yeah. they were there undercover, I didn't meet a single person or hear of a single person coming from that side of the, the broader industry. Uh, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on why that was? Is it just that it's too early in Oregon for corporates to send their representatives to these kind of events? Yeah, you know, I think that this is such a novel program and I don't know that the big biotech pharma know what to do with Oregon <laughs> and what's happening here um, on a number of reasons. I don't know that they've fully strategized how to look at this from a pharmaceutical standpoint, psychedelics as a, in general, right, of how do they let that and work with that in their ecosystem as they've defined it over the years. Um, and so... That's one piece. And then, then outside of that, right, you have psychedelics coming up. These things that are basically generic that they, you know, have been around for a while. Everybody knows kind of what they are and what they do. And yet, you know, dealing with that. And then separately, how do you deal with now a state that makes these same medicines available in the natural format to anybody 21 and over who's gone through a screening process, right? So uh, I don't know that they are, I think they're probably not here and showing up at this because psychedelics as a whole are, are confounding and, and then Oregon separately is a little bit different. Like, is this going to replicate? Is this going to be seen elsewhere? And how will we deal with that? I mean, we did see Compass at the very early on, I think having a bit of a, a pushback and there was some pushback early on with 109 of, you know, whether or not there was support for it from those organizations. Um, but by and large, I think that there's a hands off and wait and see approach to, to what happens here. And, and that's probably why they're waiting on psychedelics as a whole, I, I would gather, right? Like how much can be made off of these substances when they are generic and can be grown in your backyard. Sure. Yeah, the whole state model versus FDA yeah. model, it's, it's very front and center in the industry. And uh, many would say that one is the wrong way, one is the right way. And I've heard that argument in both directions. Personally, I believe that the more that more people are trying, especially if they're doing it intelligently and thoughtfully and ethically, the better. And we don't know yet what is best until we actually try it and measure how effective it was and what went wrong and learn from that. So I think it's good that there are biotech companies getting millions of dollars in funding to bring new compounds through the or compounds derived in new ways through the yeah. FDA process. And also this sort of grassroots, organic, state by state or even city by city approaches uh, is really a wonderful way for more of the populace to be heard. And I think that's what Oregon really represented. I should say the Horizons Pacific Northwest event in Oregon was every single person's voice really being heard, or at least I hope that's how they felt, because it, it seemed that way to me that um, there was there was no malicious or vitriolic debate. There was no uh, shutting down of another person's opinions that, that again that I witnessed at least yeah. and that was really encouraging I think for the essence um, of this movement and this community so with that I know we have about less than 10 minutes left and, uh, yeah. and I'll open up to any questions from the audience unless you would like to say anything else yourself yeah no to add to that David I, I completely agree I think all avenues too many people are suffering right now uh, we need all avenues, and and I think it's important that we don't shut out any one of them, because that's shutting out care that somebody could have access to, right? So when we look at these, it's not about this or that; it's about a bunch of swim lanes all headed in the right, same direction. And where do we need to apply people so they get to where they're going? I think that's what we have to how we have to view this. And it's going to and we and there doesn't territorialism doesn't need to happen right now. We know these are helpful. We know they can help people. We know people need help. It's that simple. And so this is another avenue, the FDA model, the medical model, that's great. And that I'm so excited to see these tools being offered in that arena and more people will need it than those who can get it in that avenue. And so that's really what's important here is that we open up all of these avenues safely and, and effectively. 
And that's it. We have my trusty sidekick, Alan, on the line, who can relay any questions that have been coming in either on the Zoom chat or over any of our social channels. I feel and you've covered many of these. Uh, one specific to timeline, uh, should Oregon legalize? What do we anticipate the next steps are as far as facilitators becoming approved, basically legalization to when one could actually walk into a provider and receive treatment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as it stands now, uh, training programs can take on applicants, and I believe in some cases training programs are underway. I think when the service centers will be up and running, that's still a question mark because the rules for service centers have not been set. A lot of the conversations that occurred at Horizon were around, well, are these going to be profitable businesses? Can you do this with, uh, with issues like 280E, which those of you who do not know, 280E is tax code that deals with um, uh, how one banks one's money when you are dealing with a business in Schedule One substances. Uh, that creates a lot of undue financial burden on the parties that carry the Schedule One substance. Um, so uh, those pieces are still being worked out. The long answer is it's probably going to be about anywhere from three to six months before facilitator, before um, the beginning of the year when you know a lot of this is supposed to kick off and service centers and everything is is likely to be open. Um, the, if the question was around how long is the programming for becoming a facilitator, uh, those are being set, but I believe uh, the curriculum is around 120, 160 hours. I need a double check of curriculum time. And does that include, just a follow-on question for me, does that include any, in, is it called impracticum or? Practicum. practicum yeah. yeah. No, and there's a big data around, a debate around practicum. You know, I think that it was set, the last I read was around 40 hours of practicum. Uh, which for those who don't know, that means kind of like hands-on um, being a, um, you know, kind of a shadow to someone who is providing this and being able to uh, sit and kind of uh, apprentice in a way uh, during that time. But yeah, that's, that's about all there is. I, I believe last I saw baked into this uh, about 40 hours on top of the, um, the in-class time. So we're looking at, most likely given all, all potential risks of delay and bureaucracy and so forth, there will likely be doors opening, call it summer at some point next year. And are you, are you aware of uh, either service centers or facilitators intending to do so broadly throughout the entire state? Or do you think there really will be a deep concentration in say um, the, the, the biggest cities no. Yeah. Well, that's that's to be debated too, and this is the interesting part, which I think uh, we're hoping to um, take part in those conversations in the future, which is the ability for counties to opt out of the state psilocybin, uh, psilocybin services program. And what that means is each county has had its ability to opt out of this before it takes effect at the end of this year. There is an election coming up in November, at which time uh, certain counties and county commissioners have either decided to put this up for a vote or not. And so where we're seeing this play out is that, yeah, we expect, hopefully, that Portland uh, will be able to have these service centers, but we know that that's not the state. The state has a very diverse population. I think about uh, the work that I do with veterans of war and, and the veteran populations here in Oregon. Um, Portland isn't the most accessible always. And so how do we really open up uh, clinics? There are places down south and to the east that are looking to open up service centers, um, which are required for this to occur. It, without a service center, you, it doesn't matter about facilitators because you, you will have to provide these at a service center. And so therefore, um, we'll see how this plays out. But uh, the, the voters in those counties tend to... Um, tend to hold more conservative views uh, in a lot of ways. And, and some of them did not vote for this in the first place. And so we need to be mindful that there will be parts of the state that will not have access to these uh, or very restricted access as it were because of the opt-out measure. Yep, which I know is somewhat mirrored in Colorado with Denver being 
generally a more liberal or blue part of the state and yeah. in other parts, not to generalize, but other parts of the state less so. So we'll see a similar dynamic, I imagine, in, in Colorado come this November. And for those who don't know, there are two ballot initiatives in, uh, in the works for November or having, we'll have the populist vote on measure 58 and 61. Each of those are slightly different. We won't go into the differences now, but quite material differences uh, when you actually look at the details and uh, many, again, many opinions about which is better, which is more well conceived. Uh, I, I want to ask you maybe another question about Colorado, but before I do, Alan, do we have any other questions you'd like to share? Uh, we have two more. I feel like one tees off our conclusion very well, so I will leave that to the end. Um, from our chat, I'm curious if there's concern over big pharma cutting off the swim lanes because they see the two to three dose psychiatric treatment, I'm sorry, psychedelic treatment versus a potential usage of SSRIs. It seems like a threat to their business. What is being done to get ahead of this? That's a great question. I mean, uh, you, if you look at the way the pharmaceutical model works, it's an annuity model right? A pill for life, right? In a lot of ways, the cures aren't sought a way to deal with the symptoms uh, are often sought. Not always, right? Some of these medications work great on, on others. So when we think about is Big Pharma going to come in and cut this off? Um, they could. That is always a possibility in, in a sense that uh, there's a desire to make this into a annuity medication, but I think what we also know is, is that the real, the real power here that we're seeing is, is with the heroic doses that do take a few sessions and then you see this continued healing over time. Um, and so I think that for that reason and the generic quality, a lot of the substances that like the classic psychedelics, I think that there's, I don't see that happening as, as rightfully unless it was done through the lobbyings of Congress, right? Or, or some way of, of that nature, something more nefarious uh, or Machiavellian, but I don't see it being out front play because business-wise, there's just a lot playing against these substances where they're at from uh, patentability and then also how they're most effective. Um, but who's to say, right? Microdosing, uh, if you cut out macrodosing and just let people have microdosing, is that not just an annuity medication? I don't know. Um, it's, it's a question we should ask ourselves, what does that look like? But uh, to answer the question of the respondent, no, I, I, I don't think anybody's doing anything about it. And I don't think that it, there's a real threat yet there, but, you know, crazier things have happened. Mm. <laughs> and then our last question, which I feel like, David, I'm sorry, do you want to add anything to that? Our last question is, <clears throat> what is mission accomplished for both of your organizations? Uh, which I feel like leads into a beautiful segue to our conclusion. Um, but what, what is your ultimate achievement as an organization or as an individual? Should I just go I first? You. Okay. Um, yeah, no. <clears throat> our, mi our mission, right, is to ensure all Americans have the support they need accessing psychedelic assisted care. So what does mission accomplished look like? It looks like every state having uh, this kind of tangential model, this community model, as well as the medical model available to its citizens. So it's that way those who don't feel uh, ingratiated or even desired by the medical model or have been actually marginalized or ostracized by that model have a place to go. As soon as we can see that these therapies are accessible to everyone, no matter where they come from, why they're needing them or who they are, that's when mission is accomplished. And we have a long way to go there. So uh, a lot of work to be done, but I think that we'll hit a tipping point, right? There's going to be a point where enough people get the healing they need to cover those base needs so they can start looking out for other people, the planet, everything else. And it's just so many that we have to get there that have really had a chance to, to heal themselves uh, so they can be better uh, citizens of the world. You know, it, it may be shorter than I think, but our mission is start here, our own backyard, make sure the folks in our communities have access to these however they need to get them. And that's when we'll feel mission accomplished. Well, speaking on behalf of Maya, I have to say, I, given the, the levels, the severe, severe levels of anxiety 
and trauma and pain and the other manifestations of suffering that are, are rife in our society. I'm not 100% confident that our, my true mission and our true mission will be accomplished within my lifetime and certainly hope so, but that's a big one. And so mission accomplished is going to look like stepping stones. You know, there will be micro missions, micro accomplished along the way and starting to see pockets of society be able to escape these levels of suffering. And honestly, I don't have a, a horse in the race about whether that's thanks to psychedelics or thanks to any other intervention or phenomenon out there. I really think that it needs to happen and that the more methods and approaches that we're using our genius and our goodwill in the world to bring that relief from suffering, the better. And it needs to happen quickly because some of the consequences that we're already feeling across society and in our environment and our economics are very clear. Uh, so there will be micro missions accomplished. I think if I could personalize it a little more, my two-year-old daughter, Savannah, is going to one day be of an age where legally she can ingest a psychedelic and she'll choose to enter an altered state of consciousness, an altered experience that will hopefully open her mind and help her find some of the, the beauty and the magic and the connectedness that's out there. And I want her to be able to do that with more support, more education, more transparency, less both conscious and subconscious fear of the, the law and the powers that be and the sort of societal programming that surrounds most of us today choosing to take a psychedelic. And I wrote a piece about this on Medium, which uh, maybe Alan can post in the chat. And I would love if, if that inspires anyone else to have a similar mission, especially if you have kids or are planning to. And I think that bringing thoughtful you know, collaboration through shared learning, speaking shared languages, of which I believe one is data, and to help each other understand these compounds and the experiences we get from them is actually the best high leverage approach that I have to solving this problem and achieving this mission. And I'm gonna pass it back to you in a moment, Britt, to close us out, but I'll, I'll share while I'm speaking that if anyone out there is interested in this work that we're all doing, I really appreciate you following us on Facebook, especially if you are, uh, or I should say, also if you are a psychedelic oriented practitioner of any type, such as a therapist, a coach, uh, counselor, a clinician or a retreat leader, please um, join our private Facebook group for psychedelic providers. And then we also have a LinkedIn group, which is for novel mental health treatment providers and support services. And again, we'll be posting links to those. So that is all I will say for today, apart from thank you everyone for joining and for taking time on this conversation. And Britt, I'd love if you share where people can find the NPA and continue the conversation. Yeah, no, and it is a generational thing. And thank you for, for passing on the next generation. I think we need to look in that longer term format. And for those on the call, uh, yeah, no, um, we are, if you are a, a future practitioner, someone who's interested in state level um, regulated access or uh, any of the alike, go to yournpa.org, your, Y-O-U-R-N-P-A.org yourmpa.org uh, for more information. There you can submit your, your name, email address, et cetera, and we will add you to our mailing list um, for information about our soon to be launch, more information about Oregon, and uh, you know, hopefully come November, uh, information for those of you looking to practice in Colorado as well. Cool. Many, many thanks to you, Britt, for taking time on this conversation. It's always fantastic seeing you and yeah. with more work to do together. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Yeah, thank you, David. Thanks, everyone.